In this video, I explain some of the basic economics of price ceilings and price floors. So these price restrictions either put a lower bound on what the price can be, or an upper bound on what the price can be. Uh, and, and they actually conflict with what our equilibrium of supply and demand is going to tell us. So remember, sort of with just supply and demand, we have demand, we've got supply, and we look at the intersection between those two and that will tell us the equilibrium price and quantity. And if we look above the equilibrium price up to the demand curve, that gives us our consumer surplus. Down below this price to the supply curve will give us our producer surplus. When the government comes in and puts one of these price restrictions, that can interfere with what trades will occur. You can't go below a floor and you can't go above a ceiling. And sort of, if you think about it that way, you can think about, well, you can stand on a floor. This diagram is sort of a graphical mnemonic way to think about uh, the difference between a floor and a ceiling. You stand on a floor and you bump your head on a ceiling. And so, while it might be counterintuitive that the ceiling is going to be below the floor, just think about it as a three-story house. The floor is going to be on the third floor, and the ceiling is going to be the ceiling on the first floor. And with the ceiling, we want to get to the second floor where the equilibrium would naturally take place. And when the floor is binding, we would want to get to the second floor again. And so you can kind of see the difference between those. But that's just a mnemonic to try to remember the difference between ceilings and floors. And so you can see that if we just read off of the supply curve and the demand curve what quantities correspond to this binding price ceiling, that will tell us what the quantity supplied and quantity demanded are. And so what we see here is that when we impose a price ceiling, the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied. So we have a shortage. And in other words, we've got more at the, at the price that is allowed to prevail in the market. We've got more demanders than we have suppliers. There's more quantity demanded than there is quantity supplied. Well, now that we understand that there is a shortage, let's consider what happens to consumer and producer surplus, what happens to total surplus, and what happens to deadweight loss. Let's think about the welfare implications in two steps, initially and then after the price ceiling. So initially, the consumer surplus was area A plus B, and producer surplus was E plus C plus D. That means the total surplus is this big triangle here. Now let's consider what happens if the price ceiling is a regulated price of PC and only a quantity of QS is traded. So a quantity of QS is traded at a price of PC. Let's just go with the standard definitions of consumer surplus and producer surplus. That is, consumer surplus is going to be out to the quantity traded down, uh, from the price up to the demand curve. So that's going to include A plus C. And the producer surplus is going to be from the price down to the supply curve, out to the quantity traded, area E. And so now if you look at the difference between total surplus after the ceiling and before the ceiling, what we'll see is that areas B plus D are going to be dead weight loss. Those are units that are no longer traded because it's no longer worth supplying them, but the marginal cost was below the marginal willingness to pay of some consumers. And so those units should have gone traded, but they went untraded. So that's why it's deadweight loss. The thing that you'll notice here is that it's not unambiguous that consumers are going to be made better off as a group. First thing to notice is that they have to give up area B in order to get area C. And so it depends on which area is bigger, whether the consumers are going to like this price ceiling policy as a group. Uh, so area A plus C may or may not be bigger than area A plus B, and whether it is or not will determine whether a consumer lobby group will want to promote a uh, price ceiling policy here. But that deadweight loss is big enough, especially on the consumer side of that, uh, we might actually reduce the uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus at the same time. Now that's ignoring other issues here. Uh, for example, we didn't discuss 
how to resolve this shortage here. Quantity demanded exceeded quantity supplied. And these consumers who are going uh, unsatisfied here um, may or may not expend resources to make sure that, um, that they actually get their allocation of this good. That those resources that are expended would need to be added to deadweight loss. Deadweight loss is at least going to be B plus D. Alright, now let's consider the welfare effects and what actually happens when we impose a price floor. That is saying that the price cannot go below a certain amount. We're going to impose that price floor above the original equilibrium price because otherwise it wouldn't be binding. Um, people wouldn't even pay attention to the price floor if the equilibrium price was above that. A lot of the intuition just follows through from what we talked about with a price ceiling. At the price where the price floor is set, the quantity demanded is going to come from the demand curve, and the quantity supplied will come from the supply curve. It's that the suppliers are going to produce more than there is demanded at this. But the difference between QS and QD is a surplus, and we're again going to take the minimum of those two to see what quantity is actually traded. There's only QD units demanded here, the suppliers can't force the demanders to buy them, and so this is what's going to be demanded in the market. So let's consider the welfare implications here. The consumer surplus initially before the price floor was put on this market was A plus B plus C. And producer surplus is E plus D plus F. Now let's consider what happens when we look at the price floor. If you look at the price floor out to the quantity traded, go up to the demand curve, area A is now consumer surplus. If you look at the price, at the price floor, down to the supply curve out to the quantity traded, we get B plus E plus F. Now again, we'll get some deadweight loss here, and this again is because we get a lower quantity traded than the equilibrium quantity, and there will be units for which the marginal cost was below the marginal willingness to pay, yet those units went untraded. Even in the most optimistic view that the lowest cost suppliers were the ones who were able to find demanders in the market. Um, so again, just like with the price ceiling, this represents the most optimistic view uh, with respect to the welfare deadweight loss implications. We'll say that it's C plus D, but there are suppliers who uh, have a lower marginal cost than that price floor, um, and they're willing to expend resources up to the gains that they could get from selling at that higher price to make sure that they get demanders to, uh, to actually come, um, come buy their product. So all told, when you look at these price restrictions, either a price ceiling or a price floor, Really, the basic analysis yields that there's going to be some deadweight loss. If you take it a step further and ask, well, what are people going to do in response to a shortage or in response to a surplus? What actions might they take? And will they be expending resources in an unproductive manner uh, in response to that? That can only increase the deadweight loss. But from the standpoint of efficiency, we tend to not like price ceilings and price floors. They, uh, they tend to uh, lead to misallocation of resources in other ways, um, for example, rationing by waiting or, um, or sort of bribery to get around these price ceilings and